Good morning, everybody. So I have to tell you that is this like crazy loud? Okay. Um, last night, my daughter had a flute performance and asked me to accompany her on piano. I'm not sure which of these two things took more preparation or is more nerve-wracking, but I'm happy to be here this morning and have that over with. Um, so every reconstructive surgeon um, in our subspecialty has a favorite element of our job. And so this may be um, a surgery that they perform, or it may be a clinical condition that they treat, but there's always some aspect within our subspecialty that they really enjoy. Whenever I'm asked, what is your favorite surgery that you do? My answer's been consistent. Typically I say something a little more profound, like I like the wacky, crazy stuff, but really what it comes down to is that I truly love the element of reconstructive surgery. And it really doesn't matter what the nature of the abnormality is, it could be vaginal trauma from childbirth. It could be radiation for cancer. It also might be a congenital anomaly. So regardless of what the underlying condition is, what I find so exciting about our subspecialty is the ability to construct normal anatomy for patients. Today we're going to be discussing neovaginal reconstruction, specifically in the setting of malariogenesis and optimizing outcomes. So our objectives, much to everyone's chagrin, I'm sure, we're going to start embryologically, probably centering there in the middle of the room where our medical students are, um, also looking at an anatomy. We'll be discussing indications for reconstruction. We'll outline the various types of procedures with their associated benefits and potential complications. And then we'll talk about ways to maximize outcome. So again, reaching way back. And I apologize to the residents, we are post pre -ox. This maybe would have been good a month ago. Um, <laughs> But for those of you who maybe don't have this in the forefront of your mind, the embryological origin creating the vagina is when the paramesonephric ducts fuse and elongate and uh, attach to the urogenital sinus. That fusion will um, result in elongation of the sinovaginal bulbs causing the vaginal plate and also creating the uterus. So the central structures all originate from that embryologic origin. When there's not fusion of the paramesonephric ducts to the urogenital sinus, there is an absence of the vaginal, usually of central, excuse me, central malaria structures. But because the urogenital sinus embryologically comes from a different origin, those structures are abnormal. So again, we're looking at the uh, mid-sagittal view, the midline structures present in a patient who is embryologically intact. And in malaria neogenesis, we see an absence of the central structures. On external examination, the external genitalia is relatively normal. So you can see all of the typical structures, except there is no vagina. So a year ago, ACOC updated the diagnosis, management, and treatment for malaria and agenesis. And part of their recommendation was that women who have vaginal agenesis should be given dilation as a first-line therapy. The reason that dilation is offered is because it does have a high success rate. So while we are here to talk about neovaginal reconstruction, I want to support our uh, college and their recommendations. So I do want to talk briefly about vaginal dilation therapy. So this again is a first line therapy because the success rate is over 85%. So this clearly has the lowest morbidity um, and also is very cost effective, saving about $17,000 per patient. So while malaria neogenesis is an uncommon disorder, it's still, this is fairly significant amount of money. There are two types of dilation therapy. The Frank method was described as a form of active dilation using some sort of vaginal dilator. So these are Lucite dilators. This is a medical grade acrylic that the dilators can be manufactured specifically for the individual patient. The patient then usually lies in lithotomy and she directly applies the dilator to her vaginal, um, vaginal bud and she's able to then apply pressure and create a vaginal space. This method has been modified by Ingram. This we call the bicycle seat method. Um, this is a passive form of dilation where a woman will place the dilator at the vaginal vestibule and then she will lower herself onto a bicycle seat and it's her weight that will ultimately result in forming a vagina. She'll use successively longer and wider dilators. However, there are risks to dilation therapy. So there's been description of cystitis and urethritis um, also, with that pressure on the vaginal opening, um, that could result in decreased blood supply leading to necrosis. Fistula formation is also possible, as is prolapse. 
There are also potential patient factors that may um, cause failure of dilation therapy, and these include things like a young patient who maybe isn't that motivated, perhaps her relationship status isn't stable, she may have some learning disabilities, and then there are social factors. Um, maybe she doesn't live in a place where she has privacy. There may be other socio-cultural factors. Perhaps there's transportation issues or she hasn't had appropriate counseling. So all of these elements are important to recognize in the patient's um, opportunity to become uh, successful with dilation therapy. So then the indication for reconstruction could include a complication from dilation therapy. If the patient has pain or bleeding with dilation, she may also um, need reconstruction. Or she actually has successfully created a neovagina with dilation, but despite that, she still can't accommodate penile penetration. So one of the fathers of urogynecology, the late Dr. Lee, who was my mentor and colleague at Mayo Clinic, was famous for saying, never operate on a stranger. What he meant by that was, is you should know your patient well enough when you're taking her to surgery that you could consider her your friend. So as we're preparing for reconstruction, there are some elements that we have to know in order to be successful surgically. The first, as we've already identified, we have to assess for midline Mullerian structures. Just because she has vaginal agenesis does not mean she won't have any uterine tissue, so we need to assess for that. This is most inexpensively performed with ultrasound. It's a great um, method to assess for this. I would say MRI is surpassing ultrasound because of the opportunity to look for active endometrium. I'm looking at Dr. King here. Um, so um, she uses MRI quite frequently with patients um, looking at active endometrium for endometriosis. We would do the same thing. And the reason this is important is remember that whatever the uterine structure is that's there, it's typically a closed off space. So these patients may have pain and they may be at risk of needing some additional surgical intervention. Additionally, it's important to assess pelvic anatomy. So we're going to be operating in a space where we already know there's a congenital anomaly. She might have renal issues. Maybe she has a pelvic kidney. And you really want to know that before you start poking around with the laparoscope. So the SENS project, which, which stands for Scotland, England, Norway, and Sweden, is a multidisciplinary team um, that has been looking at women diagnosed with malaria agenesis. And the team comprises psychologists, gynecologists, urologists, pediatric surgeons, um, endocrinologists, and this whole group cares for these young women. The psychologist who um, initiated this study wanted to assess for certain barriers that these women have in being successful with their treatment. And the idea is that there are three components to what we'll call the talk. The first thing is that these patients, from the time they're diagnosed, they're told something's wrong with you. Not only is something wrong with you, but you have something wrong with you that other women have. So right off the bat, these women are feeling this pressure to be normal. That the idea of getting a vagina is going to make them a real woman. So there, there's a stigma there. Secondly, the language that's used by the healthcare provider can really direct the conversation, can direct the treatment conversation in a way that's not really allowing patient autonomy. So again, you're broken, you can't have sex because you don't have a vagina, so you're not really a woman, and we need to do surgery to get that better. So patients might think they need to go into surgery in order to create a normal anatomy and therefore a normal kind of sense of themselves. The reality is what is normal in sex is not really a patient-focused component, and that's lacking there. Third, treatment demands are considerable, and it really isn't um, saving a patient management if she undergoes surgery. Dilation is a reality whether a patient chooses dilation first or whether she chooses surgery. Not only that, follow-up is recommended. So these patients, when they embark on this particular pathway, really need to be counseled that the treatment demands are significant. So the outcome from this assessment was we need to shift the definition of success from anatomy to patient autonomy. We really need to meet our patients where they are. So the other discussion point I wanted to make has to do with the idea of gender and sexuality. So gender identity, for the first year residents, can you tell me when you see gender identity, what does that mean to you? What is the definition? No, I don't all speak up at once, it's okay, take turns. <laughs> So gender identity has to do with how you perceive your own gender, right? So your, how you see yourself can be congruent with your assigned gender at birth, or it may differ. And this is where we have the terms transgender and cisgender, okay? How about sexual orientation? Second year residents, thoughts? How would you describe this? 
Exactly. So it's the it's your personal gender and then the gender to which you are attracted. So this is where you get the terms homosexual, heterosexual, bisexual. Gender expression, third year residents. What does that mean to you? Like which gender you express yourself in that cultural Exactly. So this could be how you're projecting how you perceive your gender to be to the outside world, maybe how you wear your hair, the clothing that you wear. Um, and then sexual desire. So this is a motivational state. It's an act of wanting to participate in sexual activity um, or in sexual practices. And then timing is very important in all of this. Um, we'll talk a little more about this, but what I want to kind of wrap, like help you to see with the timing element is that these women may be coming in their late adolescence, early adulthood, when perhaps they're living in the dorms, they have no privacy, but they also maybe want to engage in sexual activity. So the timing of whether this is right for her in terms of treatment is really important. So we're going to be discussing these five specific surgical techniques in detail. Um, the Abby McIndoe technique is a split thickness skin graft. This was the preferred neovaginal reconstruction during my fellowship. Um, the skin graft is harvested usually by plastic surgery in an area that one would argue is relatively inconspicuous. This may be the buttock, the lower abdomen, or the top of the thigh. Um, so this is what it looks like right after graft is harvested, and this is what the area looks like after it is healed. So, Yes, the scar is visible, but I would argue it still is a fairly um, a hideable space. Um, the skin graft is then placed over a vaginal mold. The vaginal mold is covered in a condom first, and then the um, skin graft is sutured on top. So this is an actual example of what that skin graft sewn over the mold looks like. So this is a patient with malaria agenesis. So again, we're going to start with a Maybe we start with the medical students. I haven't asked you anything yet, right? So can you describe what you're seeing here? Okay. Yep. That's right. So we have a urethromiatus in the midline. She has a catheter in place. So right off the bat, you know that she's got a urethra. You see normal vulvar structures. So we have clitoris. There's a clitoral prepuce. She has mobile labia minora that are symmetric and um, thin. She has developed labia majora. She has secondary sexual characteristics with pubic hair, although it's clipped because of the surgical element. You can see that. And the perineal body is present. And then again, like you said, we don't see any, any vaginal canal. We do see a little bit of that dimple. So when we're planning surgery, the incision is going to be placed right about here. Okay? So now I have some cartoons showing this. So we have the incision. And then dissections typically performed mainly bluntly. Um, and as it's being performed, there's usually a midline raffae that's maintained as you dissect up towards the peritone or peritoneum. Um, and so this is usually a two-finger dissection. Once you have reached your cephalad portion appropriately, then you can take down that midline raffae. It's left there for two reasons. One is that it can bleed, so it's better just to kind of leave it there and um, take care of it when you have more visibility. And second of all, it does decrease the risk of urinary tract injury and bowel injury. Um, then the mold is placed in the dissected plane, which looks like this. And then the mold is secured in place by suturing the labia minora. Um, this can be done using um, silk suture, for example. These patients are hospitalized and the mold is maintained for seven days. These patients undergo daily vaginal irrigation. The, uh, Dr. Uh, Brown mentioned with our m and that when you have a packing in the vagina, when the packing is tight enough, those patients aren't going to be able to urinate. So you can imagine that this mold being in place can compress some of the surrounding tissues. So urinary diversion is both protective, because these patients typically can't urinate, but also it's because you don't want them to, to urinate, push pressure down onto their uh, mold. So a Foley catheter can be used. I would argue that if a patient had a history of cystitis or urethritis with dilation therapy and she's very nervous about having a catheter, you could put in a suprapubic catheter as well. Um, also, you want to reduce their bowel function by using Imodium in a low residue diet, or some have described using a full liquid diet. On post-operative day number seven, these patients have a plan return to OR where the mold is removed with the condom intact and the graft is evaluated and any areas that haven't taken up are debrided. And then the mold is replaced. 
The decision of how long to keep her in the hospital varies dependent on how much of the graft is uh, taken up and how she's done so far. Uh, but typically, um, anywhere from being discharged that day to another week after is typical. These patients then are maintained with the mold for about six weeks and then they're able to initiate dilation therapy. Again, dilation therapy is continued for up to six months. Um, and then once coitus is assumed, they don't have to necessarily dilate depending on frequency of um, sex. So the abimacondo technique is the longest established surgical experience and it does have fairly low morbidity. However, it does require hospitalization. There's also a planned reoperation with potential debridement of the graft. It also requires prolonged use of the mold and or dilation. And then there's also scarring at the donor site. Next, the Davidoff procedure is a peritoneal advancement. So this procedure is started the same way with the same type of incision, same type of dissection up to the peritoneum. Once the peritoneum level is reached, the, exa the uh, uh, examining finger is removed and a dilator is placed into the vagina. This is the intra-abdominal view, so you can appreciate that this is a single incision, kind of like an oncologist would make for this patient, but it gives great visualization. Um, the peritoneum is incised and then mobilized as well. There are four tack sutures that are placed at the 12, 3, 6, and 9 o'clock position. Then through the neovagina, the mold is, or excuse me, the dilator is removed and then the sutures are grasped and all brought through the vaginal uh, introitus and then the peritoneum is brought down to the introital tissues. The peritoneum is fixed to the introitus and then the uh, intra-abdominal peritoneal incision is closed trying to reduce risk of, um, of evisceration. So the Davidoff procedure allows for potentially earlier coitus and has relatively low post-surgical complications. However, many of these patients have been operated before, so they might have had a uterine remnant that resulted in a surgery to remove that, and now they're coming back six years later for their neovaginal reconstruction, and at that time there may not be as much peritoneal mobilization. There's also a risk of stenosis at the introitus or vaginal contracture. This does result in a shorter vaginal length for these women, and granulation tissue is unfortunately pretty common with this procedure. The Vecchietti technique is a um, placement of a tensioning device, so this is a, a little bit um, of a more interesting procedure to conceptualize. So these are the components of the Vecchietti. So the tensioning device is on the lower left. That's going to be on the patient's abdomen. On the upper right, we see a small acrylic olive. And that's going to be what creates the vagina. And then we have two ligature carriers. So this procedure is started intra-abdominally, where the ligature carrier is brought down through the space between the urinary tract and the bowel, and it comes out of the vaginal dimple. The acrylic olive is threaded with suture. The ligature carrier grabs that suture then and pulls the olive up to the um, vaginal dimple. The sutures are retroperitonealized on the anterior abdominal wall. They're brought out through the skin, and then um, those sutures are fixed to that tensioning device. So these patients are hospitalized about seven days, and that traction device is tightened every day. The rate of invagination is about one to one and a half centimeters per day, and then these patients will continue to dilate postoperatively. The advantages of the Vecchietti procedure is that there's a fairly rapid formation of the neovagina, and there's no donor site scar. Um, this may be considered when there are other reasons to operate intra-abdominally. So again, patient might have uterine remnant or you know, some other issue like pain, and so if you're going to go in that space anyway, this might be something that's feasible. This does require hospitalization, and I would argue that the post-operative pain, um, especially with the tensioning, may not be insignificant, and these patients could require conscious sedation when they're actually having the device tensioned. This also has the highest risk of urinary tract injury. It may require additional procedures, and it does still require post-operative dilation. The Kratzis vulvovaginoplasty is a modification of the Williams vulvovaginoplasty. It's also called the Shears technique. So I think in medicine, we just have this tendency to want to name everything after ourselves, and we modify it slightly, and you get all this credit. But I think this is a really elegant procedure. Um, so initially described by Williams, um, the dissection was carried up to the level of the clitoris. What Kratzis did was bring the dissection down a little bit more. So Alice clamps are applied to the level of the vulva, four centimeters lateral to the urethral meatus, and then at the mid-perineal body, four centimeters lateral to midline. 
an incision is made in the medial portion of these clamps, and then each edges of the incision are closed. So the more medial portion of the incision is closed in an interrupted fashion with the knots on the inside of the vagina, and that extends up to the um, anterior portion. And then the um, lateral part of the incision is closed again in an interrupted fashion. So I think what's a little hard to conceptualize with this is that the vagina is created parallel to the perineal body. So the, the, the penetration force would be parallel to the peritoneal, uh, perineal body. And this is what the patient looks like at six weeks post-op. Okay, does everyone kind of wrap their head around what we're doing with that particular? I know it's kind of hard to conceptualize, but it's really elegant in its simplicity. So this would be a great option for a patient if there is a pelvic kidney and you don't want to get anywhere near the peritoneum. Um, there's limited contraction and this neovagina would be functional for coitus in a matter of weeks. So as soon as that epithelium is healed, you'd be able to participate in, um, in sex. Also there's no or maybe minimal need for dilation, again assuming the patient's having regular intercourse. The risks and limitations, this does require some fairly well-developed labia. So if the patient doesn't have that or there's minimal mobility of the vulvar tissues, this might not be a good surgical approach. There's also the potential that hair could grow within the neovagina as well. With the Williams vaginoplasty, because dissection was carried up to the level of the clitoris, there was a lot more urine trapping within the neovagina. However, the Kratzis vaginoplasty, this really has not been the case. All right. The last technique we'll review is the um, sigmoid neovagina. So this originated in 1911 by Wallace, was modified by Wesley and Coran, and then Joe Pratt, who was chair, former chair at Mayo, modified it again. Um, the sigmoid is the favored bowel segment because it has adequate length, there's natural lubrication, and it can allow for early coitus in older adults. So just, again, conceptualizing. Um, the sigmoid colon is identified and it is removed. Um, the distal portion of the sigmoid colon is closed. That becomes now the vaginal apex. The proximal portion is left open. That's going to be the new uh, introitus. Blood supply is maintained through the superior hemorrhoidal artery. The graft is brought through the introitus and extended out past the introitus because there may be contracture of the sigmoid neovagina and you want to allow for that. The mold is then placed inside of the sigmoid neovagina. So the advantages is that there's minimal contraction of the neovagina. Um, specific clinical situations where this may be helpful or a, a, an ideal um, surgery is that when there's fertility, patient wants to be um, maintain her functional uterus. Although I started because there have been reports of patients who become septic and actually died as a result of this, so I would definitely turn to this with caution. I think that another specific situation is maybe the patient had a, a less morbid procedure and it failed or she didn't dilate and there's some issue. So this may be something that you move toward. The risks and limitations, I'm sure nobody in this room is shocked that it needed its own full slide for all of this. Um, but this is everything that can happen. So in fellowship, I took care of three patients who had, um, they had sigmoid neovaginas. All three came in for prolapse management. So my introduction to this particular procedure is how do you help prolapse without risking your blood supply. Um, so all of these different complications are noted. I would also like to say probably none of them are really shocking to, to those of us who are, have been around bowel surgery. But if you look to the lower right section here, so um, diversion colitis has been described as has inflammatory bowel disease. Adenocarcinoma is a, is a late complication of this neovaginal um, structure. And so patients do need to be evaluated. So let's compare techniques. So we just reviewed these five different procedures and obviously there's more and there's variations, but let's compare these five. So there was a review by McQuillan and Grover looking at, it was over 6,000 articles within the world literature looking at all of the different outcomes for these um, surgeries. And they included 162 articles. This is over 4,300 patients, okay? So this is a big group, it's a big meta-analysis. So in order of presentation, we have dilation, the, we have the Macondo Davidov, which again, peritoneal advancement, the Vecchietti, which is that tensioning device, the shears or the vulvovaginoplasty, and the bowel vaginoplasty, okay? So you can see the number of patients are fairly significant. There are a lot of uh, women in this group. On this slide, um, again, a little busy, but what I wanted to highlight was that the urogenital injury for intraoperative complications was the highest in number for the Vecchietti, although again, still relatively low complication. 
So post-operative complications, again, same procedures across the top, same numbers. A um, little busy slide, but I want to um, first of all say that as a surgeon, we're always concerned about our infection rates, and so looking at the rate of infection, we see that the three highest um, procedures associated with infection were the uh, Macindo, the Vecchietti, and the bowel vaginoplasty. And coming down to reoperation. So again, the main kind of hard, fast stops for me as a surgeon, am I going to have to reoperate this patient? And the patient needs to know this. Now again, this isn't that planned reoperation. We talked about that. All the patients undergoing a macindo are planning to go back to the OR. That's not taking this into account. And then long-term complications or outcomes. So to me, the most important element of all of this is vaginal length. I mean, we're looking to create a vagina for one purpose. So it's really important to know what kind of anatomic outcomes are we getting. We can see that dilation resulted in an average vagina of just over six and a half centimeters, which is fine for intercourse. So usually it's about six and a half centimeters is the lower cutoff for that. Um, everything else was longer. Uh, the Vecchietti is the shortest, Davidov and the Macindo about similar at just a, almost nine. But the shears and the bowel vaginoplasty both created fairly long vaginas. And then I alluded to this a moment ago, but prolapse is also a consideration. We can see that the largest number of prolapse cases were among women who had bowel vaginal classes, which probably isn't surprising given there's really no support, right? So you're kind of putting it in that space and you're letting it just be there. Um, doesn't always just stay up where it's supposed to. So one of the questions that I always have as a surgeon is, yes, it's great for me to give you a great surgery and if you heal and do well from an anatomic perspective, but ultimately these patients are not just there to be an, you know, an anatomical specimen, they're there for function. So the question is, are we really measuring what's important? So what about the sexual response of these patients? So women who underwent neovaginal reconstruction were compared to women with a native vagina in terms of the physiologic and subjective sexual response while viewing neutral and erotic films. So these women um, were assessed for vaginal engorgement through photoplasmography, and that's a probe the patient placed herself, and then watched a neutral film for five minutes, and then an erotic film for two to five minutes. The changes were assessed, then a neutral film for five minutes, then an erotic film for two to five minutes. Um, questionnaires were provided to these patients to look for sexual function as well as um, distress. It's important to note as well that all of these women were heterosexual. All of the films were heterosexual couples having intercourse. What they found was that the vaginal blood flow was lower, was lower in neovaginas, but both groups of women were equally um, satisfied with their response. So both of them had, both groups were equivalent in their sexual responses. How about the type of procedure that a patient has? So the French National Association of Women with MR, uh, MRKH syndrome uh, were queried. There were 91 women who were included in this with 40 women um, responding to the questionnaire. So half of the women achieved their vagina through dilation and half through surgery with these two specific techniques being the most common. So there were no differences in the groups in terms of their age or age of onset or when they could uh, resume sex or assume sex. Um, and the uh, uh, female sexual function index scores were similar between groups. So this group then concluded that we should be offering dilation to patients as a first-line therapy. Again, low risk, and they're gonna have the potential to have equal sexual response. What about the etiology of the anomaly? So sexual well-being after neovaginal creation doesn't matter what the nature of the anomaly is. So women who have androgen and sensitivity syndrome were um, underwent questionnaire of how their perceived sexual responses are, and as compared to women with Meyer or Kutansky Kuster Hauser syndrome. So what's interesting in this, which I think on the offset, recognizing there's a difference, it might be a little perplexing, but I think if we take a step back, it makes sense. So women with androgen sensitivity have a lack of sexual confidence and more sexual dissatisfaction. So the nature of this anomaly is that these women are told genetically you are a male and your body just didn't recognize testosterone, so you ipso facto became a female. So there's a little bit of that kind of maybe per perception of what that underlying uh, etiology is. Women who have Meyer-Rokutansky, Kuser, Hauser syndrome are told you don't have a vagina as a result of this anomaly from development. So their distress was more linked to sexual situations as well as vaginal function. So it, again, kind of that identity of normal vagina and becoming a woman with this and maybe a little distancing of what that actually means. Um, 
I would argue that there are significant limitations of our current data. So the first is that the understanding of normal female sexual function is still under evaluation. Um, I would argue that that's not really well discovered or reported. Additionally, many of these studies are all retrospective and those, that carries its own degree of limitation. We talked about this at the onset, but the impact of how women are messaged about their anomaly and the options may impact the outcomes, and so that cannot be um, underscored enough. Um, also, many of these studies are done without a true multidisciplinary team. And then lastly, I would like to highlight the sexual orientation bias. So it's really not appropriate for us to only study heterosexual, cisgender women with sexual function and then show you know, videos or whatever. We really need to be fully inclusive and understand the sexual experience of all women. So what's next in our field? So I think all of these questions could be asked and considered for investigation. So when should we initiate treatment? What's the right age for surgery? What do we use for our neo-vagina? So there's, we're now looking at maybe taking a biopsy of the vaginal vestibule and then culturing those cells and using that to line our macindo, maybe using that tissue will result in better biological and hormonal response for these women. Um, what kind of a device do we use? There's also been description of a cord mole that you can actually perforate. So when you're irrigating, you can drain that fluid out. Um, initial studies have been very promising, the case review of seven patients showing that those patients had much less graft debridement. How about when should a patient start having sex? And how often really does she need to be having sex? What's her satisfaction with the surgery? How about her and her partner's sexual satisfaction? How do you both feel about what we've done? Um, you know, are they happy with the length they've achieved and their ability to achieve arousal and orgasm? How about the psychological and cultural impact? So again, um, it's great to, to start thinking about these things and there are a lot of backgrounds for these women. We need to take that into account and know how to assess that. And then lastly, but not insignificantly, expense. So we want to try to be good stewards of our healthcare system and, and healthcare in America is very expensive. We want to try to do this as in, inexpensively as possible. What about optimizing outcomes? So I would argue that we have to do a better job of preparing our patients. These patients and their families need to have support, and that's not just from us as surgeons. This is looking at psychology, genetics, there's reproductive impl implications. So we need to really kind of rally our patients and, and provide them that support. We need to do a better job of outlining the time investment. So patients that see me for construction, when we're talking about this, the very first thing we talk about with dilation is you're not getting out of dilation regardless of what route you take. So that this isn't the I can choose not to or to have dilation therapy. That's going to be integral for you for the rest of your life. Also, let's not start on this journey until you're really ready for that responsibility. Worse than having a, a no vagina when you want one is having had one and losing it because you haven't maintained it appropriately. So that can make everything more complicated. And then making sure these patients have resources for follow-up. The anatomic considerations, again, kind of divorcing ourselves from the um, outcomes of function, but looking just at anatomy. So we need to understand their surgical history, the potential for scarring. Um, do they have any abnormal pelvic anatomy? Do we need to loop in one of our mix partners to do a resection of something intra-abdominal? Does that change our route of surgery? Um, if there's a trans-abdominal approach, does it require us to do our procedure trans-abdominally? And then I would also like to draw attention to accommodation. So vaginal access is the idea that we are moving toward moving the patient from this concept of I will be normal if I get a vagina versus do I need to participate in vaginal penetration. So understanding what her sexual experience and desire is, understanding what she wants and her, what her partner wants, um, and then hopefully achieving that. The other thing that I think we do a fairly poor job of in our subspecialty is really engaging the partner status in this. So as an example, tangentially, we know when we do a posterior repair, there's a 20% chance of dyspareunia. But taking that moment to talk to the patient, if she's, in a, a, if she's a heterosexual woman and she's partnered, taking into account her partner's penile size, because maybe her partner's larger than average, and we need to know that before we go into perform an aggressive posterior repair. That may breed more dyspareunia. So asking those questions, I mean, we're all in the same world here. We're doing this for one purpose. We don't need to be embarrassed about having these conversations. 
One of the other elements about FPMRS that I think is just fantastic is this idea that we can create these teams, this team approach. Um, at no other time in my life was this as evident as when I was a fellow at Mayo Clinic. Will and Charlie Mayo were well known for giving interviews, and in every interview they would say, my brother and I, it was always this idea that we were a team, we were always coming together as a group. So this is a picture of Will on the left and Charlie on the right. Um, surgeons that um, started the Mayo Clinic. And Will Mayo was quoted as saying, no one is big enough to be independent of others. Again, the idea that we can really reach out to our partners within the system and maximize outcomes for our patients, it's huge. So this is my family. This is the family that we have in FPMRS. So with these patients alone, we may be able to interface with every one of these specialties. Radiology is significant, pediatric surgery, psychology, pelvic floor PT and urology, all of these groups can come together for just one of these patients. So this is a really um, awesome element of our job, the idea that we can create these connections. We also know that malaria degenesis happens one in 4,000 births, so it's not a very common, um, it's very not a common clinical situation that we'll face. However, these neovaginal construction principles are really applicable beyond congenital anomalies. So we could see uh, post-hysterectomy vaginal shortening. Um, I know that my partners and I see mesh-related vaginal stenosis. There's also atrophy-associated stenosis, radiation vaginitis, uh, patients who had an exoneration and looking to have vaginal function, or gender confirmation surgery. So even if we're not seeing a patient with a congenital anomaly, we still can employ a lot of these surgical principles. And I would argue that everybody in this room has the opportunity to be a reconstructive surgeon. So again, 35,000 foot view, you're doing a hysterectomy. What do you want to do to prevent her from having problems that require additional surgery? Apical support, right? We know this, you know, give good apical support, attach the vagina to something, usually the uterus ligaments. But we all have that in us. So in summary, um, the counseling element for these patients it's integral to their success. So they have to understand the investment that, that we're making in them, but that they ultimately need to commit to for themselves. The workup has been um, reviewed a few times, but again, looking for any intra-abdominal reason to perform surgery. Do they have a pelvic kidney? Um, dilation first and foremost, they don't get out of this by not wanting to dilate. That's not part of this process. The surgical techniques really need to be patient-tailored. So again, in a heterosexual woman who's partnered, we need to take that into consideration. Um, anatomic considerations, we've already identified that. Surgeon experience, so I would argue that every surgeon in this room has an experience that they've acquired through their training and then mastered through practice. It likely isn't appropriate for somebody to just radically change that and do something novel and brand new. You want to rely on your experience um, in order to give the patient a good outcome. And then lastly, but perhaps most importantly, is your institutional resources. So I frequently will say, I can be the best surgeon in the world, but if I you know, have clinic staff or a hospital that doesn't support the work that I'm doing, I'm not going to be successful. So it's really important to know what resources you have um, at your individual level. I want to thank you all so much for your attention today. We did finish a little early for any questions, if anybody has any. Other. That does give you an idea of how much room you have for the dissection. 
With a Foley catheter in place when you're dissecting, you may need to put one examining finger in the rectum and feel and have the catheter in place to guide you. Urinary tracts and bowel injuries have been reported, so it does happen, and fistula formation can also occur. Um, Dr. Gast, who's our plastic surgeon who does the gender confirmation surgery, um, I was talking to her and kind of like when you get those injuries with repairing them, the fistula formation that can occur, what do you do, and having that conversation. So I think the idea is avoiding it is obviously the first step if you can, but using the imaging and um, then kind of the dissection doesn't need to be completed quickly. You can do that relatively straightforward but in a very slow pace to try to minimize any risk of that. And then exam afterwards to see if, you know, do you notice any thin area of dissection that needs to be over some for example. Um, as far as sexual function, so it really depends on the individual patient and whether she's already been um, performing external stimulation. There's not a risk of losing clitoral sensation with this kind of surgery. Um, with a full thickness skin graft, what you're talking about. So the difference between a split thickness skin graft and a full thickness skin graft is that that skin graft is uh, harvested. We could actually do that, remove the entire layer of the skin, uh, remove the fat, and then wrap that around the mold. Um, that none of the skin grafts, when they're taken from a, you know, from our normal keratinized skin, undergo true, in true, true change. It doesn't become mucosal membrane just because it's in a place like that. Um, and that was actually one of the arguments towards using vaginal vestibule biopsies and creating um, the type of tissue that's already estrogen sensitive and has receptors. Um, it does actually create a more normal hormonal milieu and uh, bacterial milieu for those patients. Um, so I would argue that, that it does potentially lead to contracture when you have cutaneous skin within the vagina space. So did that answer? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, what happens with menopause in those women that have a skin graft? How do they have better function because they don't go through like the atrophy that maybe women that have you know, estrogen receptors would or so that's a very good question, and the answer is we don't necessarily know. So we do know there can be increase in introidal narrowing because of some of the changes from loss of estrogen, but the actual graft itself doesn't typically change. What actually is a bigger issue is when there's a loss of dilation or sexual frequent, uh, intercourse frequency. So in those patients, if they intend to maintain the patency of their neovagina, it's really important for them to continue with dilation therapy if they're not able to participate in intercourse. But there shouldn't be any hormonal change because there's no estrogen receptors within the vagina. That's a silver lining. Very. <laughs> um, thank you so much for the talk. It's going to help me in counseling patients. Um, I'm curious <coughs> as to the age, you know, the average age, the range of age, or because the patients that I see, and quite honestly, sadly, those that we diagnose for college age who have not been evaluated fully for primary amenorrhea, that we, anyway, they're not anywhere ready to go through surgery in most circumstances, usually initiate dilation, um, but don't have a partner. So you made a lot of references about working with a partner, which I think is great and awesome, but most of my patients aren't yet at a point in their life where because they haven't been able to put anything in their staff. So they fundamentally know something's not quite right, and which impacts how they relate um, and how they think about themselves. So a lot of things going on at the point where we in college are helping women. So average age for surgery and sort of what's the path to the majority? Um, and I'm just curious about all that. Yeah, so many of these patients are undergoing um, dilation at an earlier age than reconstruction, which I think kind of just common sense wise makes sense. Um, the average age is somewhere between 23 and 27 for reconstructive surgery. Um, dilation can really be started at any point, but the, the responsibility is no less important if you're moving towards dilation. Um, and, and I think you're right, when these girls are diagnosed with primary amenorrhea and they're worked up and they're diagnosed with malaria degenesis, um, at that moment the conversation I mean, that's really the moment to rally the patient and her family to understand this is what it means moving forward. This, you know, not only just your sexual function, but your reproductive function. Um, and then having that timeline started of this is kind of what the trajectory looks like for you. Um, if you're going to dilate, we can certainly start that when they're able to, which is probably in the late adolescence, maybe around 18, 20 in that age. But they could do it sooner if they had the responsibility. I mean, every 
patient's unique and has different level of maturity. But typically, and the other component that we didn't address today is that there are some girls who are born with a cloaca and they may undergo surgery with a pediatric surgeon when they're an infant. Um, those patients are usually undergoing bowel vaginoplasty. That's already been reconstructed for them. Um, and so there may be changes that are needed as they get older. And so there are some nuances that we didn't cover in detail. Um, but for those young women who haven't been able to do um, any sort of vaginal penetration, um, you know, starting off with dilation therapy, they're usually a lot younger than the so, surgery. So, sorry, just follow up. So, are, are the majority of the patients that you're operating on, they've initiated dilation, so there's a little bit more than their one to two centimeter vaginal? I would say when I'm seeing these patients, they haven't done anything yet. Okay. Yep, so they're usually coming for consultation of what, what are the next steps. And then it's getting them into physical therapy, working with dilation therapy, um, starting that part of the process with them. And again, with most patients doing well from dilation therapy, understanding the risks of surgery, many of them embark on that quite successfully. Yep, yes. I'm curious what your favorite surgery is. So if you had like, a young woman who doesn't have any any other surgery who had a bleeding with dilators and is kind of motivated, what would you prefer to do? So probably my my treatment algorithm for her would be understanding kind of where she's in her age, whether or not she's partnered, and then all the other factors looking around her sexuality. If it's a patient who um, is partnered, we need to think about a longer vaginal length. I think the Kratz's bulbo vaginoplasty is a beautiful surgery, and I think given the low risk and the lower need for dilation, that would probably be a really safe procedure. Um, I like the Macendo. It's a lot of work and it's a lot of post-op follow-up. I'm not sure that the infrastructure is inherently present for that right now, but I think that with some collaboration and, and making sure that we've kind of teed things up a little bit, um, those patients could have a good outcome. I'm just thinking like putting that patient in the hospital for a week and knowing that we're doing that for a week, that's a big investment um, and a lot of healthcare expense. So um, again, trying to identify what's important to the patient, what other indication for surgery. Um, I like Macendo, the Kratzis would be a very technically more um, easier procedure to perform. Yes. Is there been any data on the differences in funding or for these? I imagine the Macendo are getting a bit much more expensive to the wrong topic. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So looking at that, that big review that looked at the 162 articles that were included in the 4,300 patients, Part of what drives the expense is, yes, the hospitalization, but it's also the time in the OR. So depending on how long it takes you to complete your surgery, that will increase the cost of the particular surgery you're performing. Um, but it would be a great, a great resident um, per seat or a great resident project. And even looking at like, your cost effectiveness analysis and making some assumptions and the decision tree of how these patients could be managed. Um, somebody also had asked me previously, um, uh, do you have to keep these patients in the hospital for seven days? Is there anything magical that you're doing? And I would argue with the, with the irrigation there is. Um, I, I don't know that it's going to work to deviate from that plan, given that that's a fairly established a pathway for that particular surgery. But those questions, again, need to be asked. We need to start challenging that, that dogma. Does insurance They do. That's good. Other questions? I was just wondering if you could say a word about Dr. Gass. Oh my gosh. Background, exactly. Yes. Because I'm not sure yeah. what knows about her. So Dr. Gast is a plastic surgeon who trained in Belgium for about six months to do gender confirmation surgery. Um, we successfully recruited her here to UW, um, uh, led in the plastic surgery department by Dr. Benz. Um, and she has started the gender surgery program here at UW, and it's a multidisciplinary approach for patients undergoing gender confirmation surgery. Dr. King is one of the integral partners in gynecology for that group. Um, so there's a lot of um, relationships campus-wide, so it's kind of a virtual collaboration. We're not all in one spot, but, and she is just fantastic. She's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Sure. And just to expand off that, I'm really happy to brought up just confirmation surgery in regards to this. Gas a couple male-female patients um, that she wants to use about the spot that I've got to go with them. So maybe we could bring down the bike um, to make some bad ideas. Yeah, that would make sense.
um, technique are really success rates are better if you have someone helping them and coaching them and laying out a plan. So we lean heavily on Elizabeth Bloom. So those of you who aren't necessarily referring to patients to FPMRS should know about her. Great, thank you, Heidi. And I would also add to that that in the studies looking at women who successfully achieved vaginal penetration after dilation, those patients were followed every two months. So they, even though they were dilating, they were still maintaining continuity with their, their team. So there is a benefit to those patients having continue ongoing instruction and support. Any other questions? Well, thank you again.